Musical Talk, the UK independent musical theatre podcast. Welcome to this week's episode of Musical Talk. Sorry it's a bit late going out. I had a couple of interviews that I needed to get in. Um, speaking of that, we're going to have a great myriad of topics this week. We're going to be talking about a concert called The Best of Rock Musicals, hosted by Tim Rice with Christopher Biggins and special guests. That is going to the event in Apollo in Hammersmith on the 12th of May 2019. We're going to be talking to John Robbins, who's involved with the concert, and we're also going to be talking to Hugh Waldridge, who is the director of the concert. We're also going to be hearing from David Herzog, and we're going to be hearing from Michael Shapiro. So it's a lovely blend of American and British voices in this podcast. Let's start with the discussion that I had with John Robbins about the best of rock musicals. You're listening to Musical Talk. I'm John Robbins, and we are on the third floor, which feels like 20 floors, of the Victoria Palace Theatre in my lovely, humble dressing room. And it's very nice to be here. Thank you very much for talking to us. Um, You tell us what you were involved in. Oh, this is uh, Best of Rock Musicals um, at the uh, Ventim Hammersmith... Carling Rabbits Apollo... Yeah, that. ...whatever it's called this week. The big, wonderful theatre in Hammersmith that we're all looking forward to being part of. I've never played that theatre before. It's massive. It's massive. And I've played big houses, but that's on the tick list. I'm really looking forward to it. And tell us who else is involved. Oh, goodness, how long you got? Um, Well, it's celebrating the best of rock musicals, so... We've managed to cobble together absolute legends of rock musicals. Adam Pascal, who's the original Roger from Rent, um, who I've worked with before and sort of has a musical theatre glow around him. Um, uh, Kerry Ellis, um, some of my wonderful friends, uh, De- Debbie Crudyup, uh, Sabrina Elowesh, um, Ricardo Alfonso, who has the best voice I've ever heard. Um, and <laughs> to be on the same bill as these people is uh, humbling, to say the least. And it's, it's always great when you get into these concerts because, especially if you know a lot of the people, it doesn't, you know, it never feels like work and it no, is a it's break a from your everyday stuff. <laughs> and you can just go and sing your what's it's off and, yeah. and have a good, good old time. Um, do you get to choose what songs you're doing or is it all just here's a list you can choose or you're um, told? It's a discussion. Um, Hugh Waldridge, um, the producer, stroke director, stroke uh, lighting designer, stroke, stroke, and designer, designer, stroke, stroke deity, <laughs> is um, a, a friend of mine. I've worked with him for my fourth concert with him. He lives on my road. Does he really? <laughs> well, there you go. Well then if I can give you some post for him that'd be great. You can just okay. not drop it off. It's a list of demands. Um, he uh, more songs. <laughs> he contacted me and, and talked to me about the, the project and said what do you want to sing? Here's what we're thinking of you for singing. Um, uh, and it's it's a discussion that way. But Hugh's brilliant at tailoring the show to the abilities of the cast that he's got. And he's very understanding and very flexible with those things. So it's um, it's, a, it's a good set list. And the lyricist of all the best what musicals, I believe Tim Rice is involved as well? Sir Tim, yeah. Yes. Yeah, I've, uh, I did chess with Hugh at the Royal Albert Hall... 12 years ago maybe 10, 12 years ago and that was with Adam Pascal and mm. Josh Grobin and a couple Adina of others Menzel. Adina Menzel other royalties um, and that was absolutely incredible and um, Tim Rice was, was there sort of overseeing that and he's really hands on um, with his own work and he's always up for discussing the lyrics and the stories behind the lyrics and all this uh, you know the really in-depth stuff so he's, uh, he's great to work with and it's at one night Concert, yeah, one night only. There's two shows, four o'clock and eight o'clock. Um, it, sh- it should be it should be an incredible night. But that's what's so wonderful about these sorts of concerts is they are one off. You know, people talk about them. Like people still come and talk to me about the Euro Pride that I did uh, with you and the uh, the the chess concert and the you know the Les Mis 02. That was a uh, one that I did. And that was massive, and that was a one-off. And, you know, people remember these things forever, so I'm sure this will be one of those. I briefly mentioned Les Mis. It's going through a very interesting yeah. fra- uh, fra- phase at the phase. moment. <laughs> I'm lost track of what it's doing with concerts and sure. new versions and things. It's a shame always, you know, the, the blessing and curse of being an actor in town is you never get to see anything else. Right. What would be the show that you, if you, you know, you have one night off here, what would you go and see? Uh, come from away. I haven't had a chance to see it yet and it is I mean the album of it Mm. made me cry in the gym three times 
and that's that's not a place you want to cry. No. You know, people judge you. People judge me for being there, but they judge me for even worse for crying. Um, and it's just, it's just exactly what musical theatre is now. Um, and it's so different to Hamilton, and they're both so the pillars of what Broadway is and um, I've got some friends in it who are just having the time of their lives so I'm really looking forward to seeing that at some point I have holiday coming up in Hamilton so I've already booked my tickets to go and see it it's a wonderful show (laughs) and it really is incredible Um, what songs are you going to be singing that are close to you at this event at this event I'm afraid that has to stay under wraps oh no I know know. what shows then um, are are there songs from that you're excited to revisit yeah um, I believe there's songs from Jesus Christ Superstar Hair Rent Dear Evan Hansen um, oh, what else what else are there is that it um, Tommy um, oh I've run out I'm it's looking. interesting a lot of them are British a lot of and, them and you think of rock as a more you know, obviously a more American thing but it's yeah. certainly something that we led the way in well, yeah. I mean Hair came first yeah but, but that, that sort of um, second wave of British invasion bands in the 70s, you know, Led Zeppelin and uh, uh, well, the, the Stones in the 60s. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, that deep was deep. Oh, that. yeah. Deep Purple. I mean, these guys, these guys were proper rockers. And that that they also um, proper musicians as well, which yeah. has a lot to do yeah. with the technicalities. And the who? The who? Oh, oh, amazing. Who? I know. I love it. So. Do you get a lot of rehearsal time for this? Obviously, you're doing Hamilton here, so is it all very tight, uh, you know, nose, what's the term? Last minute, dare we say? No, I mean, it's not last minute. Everyone's a pro, so we get a week, which I've put on whole shows, you know, whole musicals with, with... choreography and the whole the whole works in in a week and this will be that um but everyone focuses on their own stuff uh, we will have been given and have been given heads up on on what we're doing so you know you do your homework and you you show up prepped everyone's a pro a week's easily enough it'll be slick obviously the thing with rock band is rock music is the band so going from a yeah. rehearsal room with a piano yeah to a full-on, yeah. I hope rock band or maybe oh, yeah. with an orchestra I presume I don't know but um Both. to how do you prep your voice to go from the rehearsal room to a 6,000 seat, what is effectively an arena? Yeah. What, what, what goes on in the back of your mind then? You trust the sound engineers, <laughs> quite frankly. I mean, these guys are just top of their game, especially for a venue like that that hosts so many rock gigs. You know, they really know what they're doing. Um, they'll make sure that we get what we need and we'll make sure they get what they need and team effort. And you'll be standing on that stage thinking... The Who have performed here. I know. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, the, what I think about that particular venue is Eddie Izzard's 90s stand up Glorious, which I knew back to front as a teenager, and he was at the Hammersmith, then Apollo, I believe. But, um, and yeah, that's that's how that got stuck in my head. So to perform it, on the same it's stage. Like an, it's like another Palladium, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Because you've got, not only is it on TV about nine days a week with every stand-up comedian in the world right. performing there but so many shows have played their musicals and mm. um, on. You know, I was watching YouTube last night and it had a, a, a performance of Bottom that was done oh, there yes yes the Bottom live yeah. again I knew that this is I'm, I'm understanding why I'm playing King George yeah. III now with my my <laughs> adolescence spent watching Rick Mail and Aid Edmondson beat crap out of each other just Fantastic, fantastic stuff. Yeah, no, it's um, it's a venue with history. I'm looking forward to it. Are you allowed to say anything else about the concert? Probably not. No. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell you how wonderful it's going to be, just based on the people I know that are involved. Yeah. I mean, obviously, there are certain voices that, you know, certain names you think of in the West End, and for male performers, you are one of them, which is wonderful. And it's nice that you are... You know, I could see you in Hamilton, and I am seeing you in Hamilton in a few weeks, which Correct. is nice. Um, and then I can go to this and see you yeah. sing completely different stuff. But you yeah. get the more rockier stuff in Hamilton anyway, don't you? Yeah. You get a very monkeys number, I think. <laughs> yeah, I, I, it is very monkeys. It's yeah. it's fu- it's the very astute of you. Um, Lynn Manuel Miranda wrote it to be a Beatles number, a bit like Hey Jude, which mm-hmm. is the, the da-da's. da 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 um, are especially reminiscent of the na 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 yeah, at the end of Hey Jude um, and Nine that night right and the Beatles were a British invasion just like in the American Revolution it was a British invasion so I mean he thinks on several levels 
um, all at once. If you play it backwards, it's probably an LSD song or something like that. Yeah, you can listen to it at the same time as watching The Wizard of Oz and get high. Yeah, brilliant. I have a theory if you play every Sondheim musical together, they all work as one piece. (laughs) Just one long vamp. Yeah. Yeah. Um, (laughs) Well, I'm very, very excited about this. Are you nervous at all? No. No. No, this is just pure fun. I mean, the audience are there to enjoy ourselves, that themselves, we're there to enjoy ourselves, but we're all there to raise money for a wonderful charity. Tell us about that. Um, the Charlie Waller uh, Memorial Trust is uh, a charity started by the family of Charlie Waller, who at the age of 28 was silently suffering depression and sadly committed suicide. And the aim of the trust is to bring depression and anxiety into the open and talk about it openly by educating people um, and and having concerts like this and taking the stigma away from from mental mental health issues. And shows like Dear Evan Hansen as well, they really open up that, that message. So Absolutely. it's nice that that show is making an appearance mm-hmm. and it's obviously coming to London soon. Are you excited about that show? I am, yeah. That's another um that's another album I listen to sort of endlessly. I'm a real geek with musical theatre, which is and lucky. You're not saying soundtrack, which is Oh I know. I know. I can't even say CD these days, really, can I? Um, but no, I listen to the album a lot, and I mean, Pasquet and Paul are, are just the sound of mm. of well, several things. You know, um, Last Showman as well as La La Land and all, all those things. Speaking of what musicals, I saw that Beetlejuice, the musical, is it's just on Broadway. Opened yeah. on Broadway. It looks absolutely mental. I loved that film. I loved that film so much. Michael Keaton is mental. Mm. I feel like Michael Keaton would make a very good King George the Third. What roles would you like to play once King George III has been <laughs> executed? Um, it's funny, I get, I've been asked this a lot over the last sort of ten years and a couple of them came to fruition so I guess I should just sort of pick the ones I want now. Um, I'd like to revisit Les Mis for a third time and, and go back and do Jean Valjean at some point. I feel like every actor of my generation wanted to do that. Um, I can see you being a Mormon. Being a Mormon, yeah, <laughs> yeah I need to, might need to whiten my teeth a bit. Um, but yeah, I'd love, to, I'd love to play Elder Price. That's a great role. Um, I've always wanted to do Judas and Jesus Christ Superstar, which I think might come along at some point. There's always productions of that. The one at the Barbican looks very exciting, and it's a good year for um, Tim Rice and Andrew because sure. I think at one point he had six shows running in town simultaneously <laughs> when Starlight was here. But I think this year it's going to be fine. Yeah. So and they've, they've both got EGOTs now, haven't they? They yeah. were both recently given EGOTs, um, which is, I mean, that's a life's work awarded there. So, And it's great that you're, obviously there's going to be a lot of Andrew Lloyd Webber and a lot of Tim Rice because they are, you know, the, the massive figures for the, the rock mm. musical theatre scene in this country. Mm. What's your favourite track of theirs that that you Ooh. might get to perform? Singular track. Um, I, how long have you got? I mean, I saw... Jesus Christ Superstar when I was 16, 15 or 16 and I saw the touring production, I was living in Cardiff at the time and I I remember vividly remember at the New Theatre Cardiff standing up at the end and the guy who played Judas um, giving giving me a nod and I just, that really inspired me I thought if I could make somebody feel in an audience the way I feel right now that would be a very cool way to to spend my life Um, which which I, I think really influenced me. So I, I think, I mean, Heaven on Their Minds is a great is a great track. But watching Steve Balsamo do Gethsemane is is just about as YouTubey as I get. And because it's not it's, easy, is it? What Jesus Christ Superstar? Yeah. It's not. But <laughs> but it's not really about the height of the notes. It's about embodying them with the appropriate amount of passion and storytelling yeah. I mean that's what's that's so difference between musical theatre and a rock song absolutely yeah you can just and the same with difference between musical theatre and opera is opera prioritises the sound and musical theatre prioritises the, the nonsense in opera. right well yeah absolutely I mean you look at the Mozart to Pont operas and they make no sense at all I mean they were high they were definitely high when they wrote those things um, literally and <laughs> <laughs> um, so so yeah, but uh, getting the right amount of the balance between the sound and the and the narrative is is the challenge. Because Miss has some rock quality in it at certain yeah. points, doesn't it? When I did Marius in the West End, my Valjean was Drew Sarich, who is a 
bl- true blood rock singer and did Valjean like I've never heard it before and it was inspiring for me. I was just like, wow, what a noise. Um, and he continues to, to do those things. Um, but he's a, I mean, he's a maverick at what he does. Um, His original Quasimodo, I think. Oh, yeah. Um, on, yes. you know, Derry mentioned the Hunchback of Notre Dame. I, I know it's very sad. Drew put a picture on Instagram today of him dressed up as, as Quasimodo and it was very sad. But they'll um, they'll they'll get on it. They'll, they'll fix it. They've, they're on it. Yeah. <laughs> John Robbins, thank you so much for talking to us on Musical Talk. Thank and uh, I wish you all the best of luck with the concert and in Hamilton. I look forward to seeing you in a few weeks. <laughs> thank you. It's lovely to be here. So John Robbins there, and uh, I'm now sat across from Hugh Waldridge, whom we mentioned in the interview. He's made the incredibly long walk to my house. <laughs> hello, 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 hello. Welcome back to Musical Talk. Oh, it's good to be back again. How are you? All good, all good. Weary, but good. Yes. yes. So tell us, tell us about, about this concert that you're... It's really good. Yeah. It's really exciting. Um... Last year, I did a an homage mm-hmm. to Tim Rice in Washington, which you will know was nominated for three Emmy Awards and won one. And so I wanted to do something to celebrate Tim this year. But Tim, being Tim, said, I don't want any fuss made about my birthday. Um, go ahead and do something, but I'd like to be involved. Yeah. So since I call him the godfather of rock musicals, I thought I'd put together a rock show combining the very best rock voices in our industry, the ones that would be keen and happy to come mm. and give their time, talent, love, energy to the charity. That's included in their talent. <laughs> um, and singing my favourite rock songs. And it's like a giant karaoke machine. And rather go to the Albert Hall, the charity that we're raising money for is involved with what I call mind health of young people. It's a suicide awareness charity. And rather than go to the Albert Hall, we wanted to go to a younger venue. So we gone to the uh, Apollo Hammersmith, the event in Keep Apollo. Keep it local. Keep it local, of course. We're rehearsing next door. Oh, <laughs> and um, so the hope is that it will be a bit like the Regent's Park Jesus Christ Superstar, mm. which was the first... I've done 13 productions of Superstar, so it's a score I know pretty well. But it's the first time, because it was played in the open air, it was able to be played at what I would call rock levels, levels yeah. as opposed to musical... Yeah, yeah, as opposed to musical theatre level. Um, and the score was absolutely thrilling. So Stuart Morley and Kevin Amos have taken the various songs we're going to do and have rewritten them um, for a rock band, uh, enhanced rock band, and we are pretty excited with how it's sounding. West End Chorus, 24 of them. Because um, when, when Jesus Christ Superstar first opened, it the band was rock musicians, wasn't it? It was, yes. John, Hi- uh, John Priceman was on bass. Um, yeah, I'm, I, I remember as a, a young person going to it very, very early on. But I remember Aunt Bowles was in the pit, so the band were in the pit, and I remember sitting, um, watching down, and seeing this tiny conductor, that's why he was called Ant, his real name was Anthony, but Ant Bowles, conducting these musical forces. And of course it was different from some of the other musicals of the day, like Oliver or A Charlie Girl or whatever that, like that, but I mean, it was that driving bass and kit, which is what defines a rock musical, I think. That feel in that like, yeah, exactly, chest, exactly, like, and, and four on the floor, I believe they call it. <laughs> well, w- we did um, an opera version of it in an opera house last year. Uh, David Michael Johnson, who has been in practically every show I've done for the last thirty years, he was Jesus. Mm. Um, he was Simon Zelotes in 1991, and so he's gradually. He, then he was Judas, and he did Jesus last year, and we played that at rock levels. Uh, in an opera house and it is the most thrilling score and some of the other stuff you know obviously we've got chess and we've got uh, all of Tim's stuff Aida um, not all of Tim's stuff um, a lot of Tim's stuff um, and then of course there are things like We Will Rock You which are out and out rock but it's interesting shows. how they're now considered musical theatre canon it? yeah absolutely it, 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 it is but it's melodic rock you know, it's not noise. It, yeah. it, 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 there are melodies. The whole thing about the Queen oeuvre, that they are very hummable tunes, which is a terrible thing to say, but it is true. And also simple things like dunk gunk ga gunk gunk ga gunk gunk ga is as well known as 
the introduction to uh, New York, New York, you yeah. know, the, the riff. So it's earned its place at the table. And was it Brian May? He wanted something that the audience could interact with. Didn't That's he? right. That's why he came up with that riff. That's right. I saw Bohemian Rhapsody yeah, too. Yeah, exactly, so. <laughs> exactly. Well, the funny thing is, the guy playing Brian May is more like Brian May. I mean, it is uncanny. Even Brian May says. Well, a friend of mine saw it and said he got Brian May spot on. Incredibly boring. <laughs> well, no, I, I, I can't agree with that. Uh, he is a doctor, after all. Yeah. Um, if you get him on the right subject, I don't think you'd find that. But um, no, Brian May now copies the guy in the movie. You know, he was he was that good. And I kind of did watch Bohemian Rhapsody, thinking, I wish we were rock you were more like this. Interesting, interesting. I, I mean, I was on the periphery of all that time. Mm. Um, I was probably 10 years younger than people like Peter Straker or whatever. And Peter and um, Freddie were very good pals. And so I went to Lambda, which was next door to where Freddie Mercury lived. So, you know, one was very aware of Queen and the concert, obviously, Live Aid. In fact, funnily enough, I was responsible for some of the technical side of the satellite transmission. Don't ask how, but we all got involved. And so I remember that concert very, very well. And that is extraordinarily well done in the film. Yes, I mean, I sat there, th I sat there thinking, is this just footage? It, yeah, yeah. It, it can't yeah. be because yeah, it's widescreen and, and it's... Yeah, you just can tell by the lighting. The lighting equipment's wrong. <laughs> and but if you're looking at that, then you failed. <laughs> yeah. But I, I still think the, the way they got the scale of it... Oh, it's extraordinary. It's, it's a wonderful bit of uh, footage. It really is. But going back to what we're doing, mm. um, of course, we have Kerry Ellis uh, from We Will Rock You and Sabrina Alawesh and Noel Sullivan and Ricardo Afonso is now back. Is Brian May making an appearance? He's not this year. No, he's he may come and stand at the back, but he's uh, obviously he was in, he has an open invitation. He's done it three times, but he can't do it this. And and truthfully, it's quite good because inevitably, when you have somebody like Brian with you, the production schedule is altered. Mm. One rehearsal he arrived at without a guitar, oh. and you thought, okay, air fine, guitar. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, that really was hair guitar and air guitar. Um, so, but, but when he comes he can't keep to a musical theatre schedule because they're used to a sound check taking X, Y, and Z. Yeah. So it's going to be tight. We're doing two shows at four and eight. Um, and I think it's going to be a really... Uh, what we're planning, I think the audience is going to have a damn good time. I well, really do. We're saying with John, it's such a massive venue and it is a world-famous yes. rock venue, isn't yes. it? Yes. I mean, the, the frightening thing is, if you're a promoter, is that the entire auditorium of the London Palladium can go in the circle. Good grief. I mean, it is that large. It holds 3,500 people. So it used in, to be about 5,000 as well. Did it really? Yeah, yeah we're standing. Yeah. yeah. Well, if, if, if you do two shows and we're doing that, that's 7,000 people. So effectively, you are trying to fill the Lyric Shaftesbury Avenue for a week. That's what you're trying to do. So do, do you look at, do you choose the songs yourself? Or yes, do you... yes, 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 yes. So what were you looking for? Um, With singers in mind? Or? Yes, a bit of both. Um, I know chess pretty well. Um, having done it with Adina and Adam um, and Kerry, of course, and Marty Pella. So, John Robbins. And Josh. And John Robbins, exactly. And so I know that Christian, who was Josh's replacement stroke mm -hmm. cover, um, should he be delayed by flight. So I know he knows Anthem. So I know that Anthem is a good song for this kind of band. So we'll have a bit of Anthem. Um, we'll start with Superstar because that was the start of rock musicals and Tim will talk a bit about that and then we go through um, I don't like the confetti approach to shows whereby you get a whole pile of songs throw it up in the air and where they land you sing them so I prefer there to be a bit of a arc yeah yeah so that history mean, or timeline um, or? just for the audience just for the, it, 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 there is obviously you're going to go in and out um, of timeline but it makes it more sense there's a, a logic behind it but what it also means is that you can't have two big rock numbers back to each other you have to put a ballad in or you have to put in just some solo piano so it means that in Evita when we get to Evita mm. although it's not a rock musical like Jesus Christ Superstar but it has got a rock section within it 
um, you have to choose something which is going to go in the format. So rather than Don't Cry For Me Argentina, which is not a rock number per se, you go for something which is rocky. So we go for Buenos Aires uh, with Debbie Currup. Um, and then you want to do something to bring it right down before you get into the loud section again. So, and because they won an Oscar for it, um, we all do You Must Love Me, um, which is the antithesis of rock. But it does show how Tim works, you know, that um, Tim's lyrics are extraordinary. He is so unsung, in my opinion. No pun intended. <laughs> you know, he's got every show he's ever written is being performed in London this summer, practically. Yes, it's a good year. <laughs> you know, and, and it's, it's quite rightly so. Um, he has the ability to collapse nine pages of dialogue into a verse of song. Uh, or chorus, verse and chorus. And as he always says, you know, it's difficult for the lyric writer because in a composer's book, you just put dots at the end of the page and you go back to the top. But you can't do that with lyrics. You, you have to. Do it to ten times. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah. Um, and I was watching Back to the Future yesterday and I remember that was taught about being a, you know, a musical. And I thought, A, how the heck would they do this? And B, the first film is only part one, and you have to have part two. And yeah, you think, would yeah. they have to compress <laughs> 45 minutes of story into 10 minutes? And I thought, musical theatre is the only me- media, yeah. medium yeah. where you can do that. Well, well, I mean, there was that famous lyric in Marilyn, the show, which was at the Adelphi 100 years ago, mm. uh, where World War Two was collapsed in the lyric, end of World War Two, I feel like a screw. And you thought, okay, <laughs> that show did not last for a very long time. Um, but, you know, no, musicals have an extraordinary, um, they, they are quite an extraordinary art form. Alan J. Lerner, who was my great guru, uh, he writes in his autobiography that it is doubtful, since the Greeks sat on the stone steps of Epidaurus, that musical theatre has changed anyone's lives. Now, I actually disagree with him about that, but that's what he wrote. So does Andrew Lloyd Webber. But he goes on and says, um, in the old days when people were ill or they needed a cure, they would go to the seaside or they'd go in the mountains or they'd have a rest cure. Mm. And he says that's what musical theatre offers. It offers a balm for the two or three hours that we have the audience with us. And I think the world... I cannot remember a time where the world... as a complete unit is genuinely so unhappy. There is so much unhappiness and angst and anger and trouble. And I think the fact that people come into a dark room and sit and watch our shows just to get away from the world for a couple of hours, I think it's quite good. And even seeing the more depressing side of musicals makes us yes realize how lucky we are to be alive and, yes you know to have this wonderful art form around us yes so. yes yes i mean dear evan hansen is a particular uh musical in in case and we are singing a song from that and in fact uh jenny thompson who was in the same jesus christ superstar at the age of 19 um that david michael johnson when we first met she is now playing the mum in dear evan hansen she's been there for a couple of years now and it's a great promo for the show as well, which yeah, is coming yeah, it's here. Coming, coming as well. A- apart from the tombra, what to you makes a rock musical and a rock song? Um, oh, I don't know how to answer that. Um, I think um, it's it's got to do with rhythm, and it's got to do with is is the bass, isn't it? Is the bass and the kit? Any song which is driven by bass and a kit will have a rock flavour to it. But do you not think something like Don't Cry For Me Argentina could be considered a rock song because it is a powerful plea and that's what the rock anthems were about. You know, you could you could smack, you could have electric guitars playing and it would suddenly yeah. be a rock song. But I think if the message behind it is also a massive thing for rock songs. I remember I was down at Sidmonton, I'm going to say in about 1975... And Andrew, as in Lloyd Webber, banged on my door at about three o'clock in the morning. He said, I want to play you something. I said, off, Andrew, it's three in the morning. He said, come down, I want to play you something. And so I went down and sat at about 3.15 and he played me this tune. And he looked at me with really haunted eyes and says, what does it remind you of? 
Mm. And I said, nothing. And he said, is it a song by the Everly Brothers? I said, no, don't know, don't know who they are. Is it a song by Bobby V? I said, I've never heard of Bobby V and his bouncing ball. And I said, it's a great Bouncing tune. Back to you. <laughs> exactly. And I, and I said, what's it called? And he said, it's Only Your Lover Returning. And I said, this is a great song. Mm. This is terrific. It's really, really good. And they recorded it with Julie Covington. And Robert Stigwood had been in Australia in those days. There was no fax, there was no telegram, there was no we transfer. So they shipped out the white label recordings around the country. And Robert Sigwood came back and he said, it's a great song, but I don't like the title. And so they went and re-recorded it. They brought back all the original demos. They melted them down, redid it. And it became a song that was, it's only your lover returning. The truth is I never left you. And it became, don't cry for me, Argentina. And Andrew had written for Crotchets, don't cry for me in his tune, da, 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 da. And he didn't like the dotted da da da. Um, it turned to triplets. <laughs> yeah, it, well, almost. Yeah. And he, um, they had this incredible success. And about a year later, we were standing in an elevator in Glasgow, and suddenly Bob Mandel and the Melacrino strings came on with a Hawaiian guitar. Do, 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 do. So it had literally become elevator music in a year. <laughs> And so to answer your question, I've heard it done with a Hawaiian guitar, yeah. but um, yeah, of course you could have a wailing guitar. I mean, most of Andrew's um, tunes you could make into rock anthems. Um, they, they have that hypnotic catch to them. They're like earworms. They, once you hear them, you think you've heard them before. And I think that's what, um, especially Tim mentioned it when he, um, played was it Judas in, he did. in um, Jesus Christ Superstar that added because he was it just seems to do something different with that role yes I mean it, 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 as you well certainly your listeners will know but it was originally called um, Judas mm. being the last days seven days of Jesus of Nazareth seen through the eyes of Judas Iscariot well, try putting that in light bulbs. You know, so I they, them off either. <laughs> exactly. So Judas suddenly became Jesus Christ. And superstar, again, you have to remember, was not a word in common parlance. And so suddenly in those days, 68, 69, saying Jesus Christ, superstar, adding superstar to the words Jesus Christ was really blasphemous. And so that's why the nuns would burn, I was going to say burn their bras, no, I don't mean that, but burn their candles or they would have vigils or say the rosary. And in fact, when I did it in Germany, I actually made the temple, um, I tried to show contemporary images like pornography um, of why the temple, selling stuff in the temple, you know, so it was a sort of classical temp contemporary look. And I absolutely encouraged the nuns to come because the more the nuns came and said, this is sacrilegious, the more the audience yeah. wanted to see no, why. Bad publicity it, it was, is good publicity. No, it was just wonderful. But it didn't go down well in the States, did it? It went down No, down. absolutely right, um, in the Bible Belt and all that. But then you see Jesus Christ Superstar, that tune got used by baseball teams and it got used by basketball teams and, you know, the Hammond organs that they had to get the organ cheering, to get the choir cheering. Um, they just use the music from Superstar. So um, it's quite interesting. Tim is very interesting on the genesis of that particular song. And of course, I Don't Know How to Love Him was originally called Kansas Morning. It's just the Kansas Morning. And um, when I do Tim's one-man show, I get him to sing that song. And it's a truly terrible lyric. The music's the same. Yeah. But the lyric is truly ghastly. But it makes the audience roar, roar with laughter. And it shows that what, Alan J. Lerner again, what makes a good lyric? Alan would always reply, good music. Yeah, it's the same, what makes good music is a good lyric. Very good, yep. Um, yep. So where are you at now with the, with the I did all preparation the for this concert? I did video work yesterday over the bank holiday um, with the video design of the graphic artists. So I've done that. Um, West End Chorus are rehearsing at the weekends. Um, now we're encouraging people to come and see it. Mm. You know, we've got this great show up for grabs and we want to share it with everybody um, and there's some wonderful deals going you know and so I hope that people who 
would like to come and see it, there are prizes for everybody. And I think, more than anything else, people have a really great time. And the, 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 that theatre's kind of one where you don't want to be too close, almost, because you want to you, get You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. And if you think um, the lighting is, say, 20, 30 feet off the ground, so through haze, the shafts of light, um, that is part of the picture. Mm. So if you are sitting in the first three rows because your favourite singer is singing, that's great, you're going to get the sweat, you're going to love all that. Or more. Or more, <laughs> yes, yeah, so hopefully not too much more. But if you want to have the real image, um, the sound is brilliant in that theatre. They spent a fortune on the in-house rig. Um, as you say, halfway back, in the less expensive seats is where I'm putting all my guests um, or people who I'm inviting to come buy tickets. Because I, I've seen, the last thing I saw there was Catherine Tate. Okay. And it just didn't work because it's, you're focusing on Re three actors perhaps. Yeah, yeah. And screens. Yeah. And well, you actually don't, you just watch the screen. Yeah. But, and, uh, but we were close enough to see her, but no yeah. one is close enough yeah. in that venue. Yeah. I also saw Nativity there, but I yeah. was much further back. And yeah. you just, for some things there, you feel such a sense of disconnect because... No, this this is, is I hope this is going to be a really intimate experience in as much as it can be. Um, we have got a really good team working on wonderful performers. Some really sense. I'm really pleased that Adam Pascal is coming over. He has, for me, a definitive rock voice. And when he sings Pity the Child, you suddenly say, OK, now I understand what that song's all about. Now, there are wonderful other rock singers. We've got some great singers in this country. Um, but Adam, I think he... He he's somebody I've worked with quite a lot because I just really like his voice. It's interesting how it's a uh, rock music is such an American art form like musical theatre, yeah. but it took the Brits yeah. to really move, to yeah. blend the two together. And I put a lot of that down to four lads from Liverpool. Um, uh, if you think that the Beatles were three guitars and a kit, predominantly mm -hmm. when they started, and because you could only write songs a particular length because the size of a single. Um, I think 3 minutes 30 was the maximum that you could put on a 45 RPM disc. Um, they were able to sell, tell stories in 3 minutes 30 seconds. And what they did, and they recorded them live, mm. obviously with George Martin a little bit later it got more and more sophisticated, but originally they just went in, just like we are here now, and instead of chatting about musicals, they would just play She Loves Me. And then, you know, they'd go on, or even She Loves You, whichever you like. Uh, and then the music, She Loves Me, Vanilla Ice Cream. Yeah. The Beatles recorded Vanilla Ice Cream, very well known. <laughs> I've been on the other side of audition tables and never want to hear that song again. <laughs> yeah. um, but it, it, it's it's great that we're, you know, continuing to get in these, these celebrations of for British rock. For the American rock fans, what is there in this show? Well, there is, you have to have Rock of Ages. Yeah. Um, but there's, there's but those songs are also very melodic and yeah, complex yeah. and musical and theater. I think that's why I've chosen them being honest um, I don't like noise just the, just noise and rhythm doesn't do anything for me I mean obviously you cannot do a show without hair um, hair when it came out in 1967 was truly extraordinary and I, I remember seeing it when I was really quite young um, at the Shaftesbury Theatre and I had never seen anything like that before. And I don't think the actors had either, because the ones that I know, like Paul Nicholas, they were out of their face the entire time. <laughs> and Lane Page and their was clothes. Like, yeah, everything. I mean, it, uh, Peter Straker again. Um, so, no, I mean, we, we cover that. I don't think there is any show that you would expect to be there is not going to be there. there there's, it is, it's pretty much covered. Thank you so much for talking oh, to us. Oh, it's great. And good luck with the concert. Yes. And um, I'll be the grey person sitting at the back. <laughs> shouting at everyone. <laughs> no, no, just losing weight. Yes. Oh. I cue the show myself. Wow. So um, if it all goes hideously wrong, there's only one person to blame, I'm afraid. Well, well thank you so much. And uh, do go and check it out. What's it called and where can people find information? I about would it? love people to go on to our website, okay. which is called thebestofmusicals.com. Thebestofmusicals.com, that will lead you to the event in 
website but it'll tell you a little bit about the show and of course this is the beginning of a new concert series because next year i hope we're going to do the best of the silver screen okay. so a bit like the night of a thousand voices we used to change who we, every year so i hope this is going to be a new uh reboot rebrand for 20 19 and 2020 <laughs> thank you so much my thanks to Hugh Aldridge and John Robbins. You can, of course, go to eventimapollo.com to find more information about the best of what musicals do. Check it out. Next, we have a discussion that David Herzog had about a musical called Queen of the Mist, which sounds very interesting. Here it is. Howdy there, musical talkers. Thank you, Mr. Hudson, for having me back on the program. I'm going to be sending you folks over to a chat that I had with Mr. Blake Klein, who is with the group Pint of Wine Theatre Productions. As we speak, they are finishing up a run in London of Queen of the Mist, a fascinating musical by Michael John Lacusa of Wild Party and Hello Again fame. Now, already this production has been getting some fantastic reviews, and according to Mr. Klein himself, ticket sales have been doing astronomically well. So I'm going to send you now to a chat that I had with Mr. Klein so that he can tell you all about this special production that's going on here on our shores. Stay tuned after the chat for details about how to buy tickets for this run and where to catch it in London. Enjoy! And today we are talking with Mr. Blake Klein of Pint of Wine Theatre Company. Welcome to the program, sir. Thank you for having me, David. Oh, it's great to have a fellow American on the program. It always makes uh, it makes awesome. talking and listening so much easier for me, I have to say. It's awesome, isn't it? Isn't it? And you said you've been in this country for uh, close to 15 years now. And yes. you've been producing um, uh, amateur works and things like that all up until recently, until you've been doing the work with uh, Pint of Wine Theatre Company. So could you tell us briefly how you got started with that? Sure. Pint of Wine was started with a friend of mine who... Uh, kind of when working on theater production and, and kind of when you kind of think of what you're kind of trying to accomplish with, with theater, I think amateur theater is wonderful and there's great things to do in that space. But I think there are times when you want to do kind of more challenging works and things that are kind of pushing the envelope in a way that that are you can do an amateur theater, but I think are better fit for the uh, professional theater model. And also working a lot in the London Fringe Theatre space, we saw uh, an opportunity for taking much more complex musicals that normally don't get done at all anywhere just because they don't fit into the big West End houses and they and they people just don't have uh, the time to try to fit them into the fringe. If you really take the time and effort and you take them from a production perspective, uh, which we are, we're a bunch of um, techies is basically what uh, Pint of Wine is. We were a bunch of techies who who got notions of grandeur uh, and then found some creatives who were happy to work with us. Sure. That That's really where we've where we've been taking musicals that, that probably people don't do because they, they think they're a bit um, too complex to, to bite off on. Sure. And now you've got a very, what looks like an ambitious production, but also looks like an incredibly fascinating production entitled Queen of the Mist. Yeah. Now... To British audiences, that name right off the bat won't ring too many bells for American audiences. I reckon it very much will. But um, even if it doesn't ring any bells for British audiences, they will have heard certainly of the composer who is uh, Michael John Lacusa. Yes. Before we delve into uh, Lacusa and his style of music and how it applies to the specific piece, uh, tell us what uh, Queen of the Mist is about. Sure. Uh, Queen of the Mist is the uh, true story of a woman named Annie Edson Taylor who was the first person to go over Niagara Falls in a barrel uh, and survive. Uh, Many people tried before her and died, but she was the first person who went over Niagara Falls in a barrel in 1901 at the age of 63. And it was done as largely a stunt for fame and fortune. And the story, as she tells the story of her going over Niagara Falls, but also what happened thereafter and and her uh, story of what success means and and the American dream and and what works and not. So it's that's the story. Now, what will be fascinating to hear about is you said you have a technical background and you and the creative team in general have technical backgrounds. So how do you go about putting together this particular kind of show? Because I'm, I'm assuming there will be some references to the going over Niagara Falls. Now, even Andrew Lloyd Webber with the most ambitious of budgets still couldn't recreate something like that even at the London Palladium. So I'm not sure how they go about doing this uh, or sort of recreating or at least retelling that story in the script, but uh, sort of bring us in a little bit on that and how your uh, technical experience has helped you with that. I think the benefit of the show is um, that it was written for off-Broadway, so it was not it was written for an off-Broadway theater. Uh, And when Lacusa approached the show is 
technically he uh, gave direction that the barrel should not appear in the show uh, okay. and and our the our barrel shows up fleetingly in the show but uh and a lot of the show takes place in Annie's mind and is viewed through Annie's perspective so Annie's going over Niagara Falls while the very important thing itself much more of the show is about the lead up towards that and the aftermath essentially the the going over Niagara Falls is a fleeting moment and there is a long discussion about what that moment was like in the show, but it's much more about what, how it happened and what came after. And uh, I think from a technical perspective, there's a, there's a lot of light. My lighting designer is lovely, uh, Bethany Gupwell, and she has uh, outdone herself uh, for a lot of light in a very small theater. And how about sort of uh, from a, a costume standpoint and a sound standpoint, mostly from the costumes, because I've seen some uh, brilliant still photography from the show. Uh, how, uh, how was the process of getting that together to show... Yeah to show the year 1901 and the years sort of leading up to it and preceding yeah. it. Yeah, um, I mean, the show has been designed, uh, the set and costume by Tara Usher, um, but um, the costume realization was done uh, together with a person who I've worked with on a number of shows named Lemington Ridley, who essentially um, built most of the costumes from scratch. So essentially they are 1901, but 1901 with a degree of looked back through history. So we're not presenting them in a pure 1901 world. There is uh, tweaks to the style itself to many times in the show seeing a tableau because on the stage at, at any number of times, you will have the full cast of seven plus the orchestra of six musicians and the conductor are on stage with our two wonderful piano players who get to hang out in the back and eat candy and, and not be on stage. But essentially, uh, the show is about a postcard. And if you if you okay. would snap, if you would snap a picture of the stage at any point point moment in time, you would likely see the the look of a 1901 patinaed postcard is is kind of the baseline concept of the design we've worked with. And I have to say, it is a fascinating moment in our country, the United States' history, uh, particularly because we know anybody who's traveled to Niagara Falls or anybody who knows or is interested in American folklore knows about the many attempts whether successful or unsuccessful, to navigate and go over the falls as a, as a, as a stunt. There have been, you know, numerous movies and documentaries made about them. So there is a whole myth and folklore that goes around you know, that particular yeah. aspect of our history. What I find fascinating is that you're also tackling themes of celebrity and finance and all that kind of thing, which I think obviously has many resonances with... Yeah entertainment today. How'd you go about uh, doing that? Not to um, wreck the whole story is the end of act one is basically going over the falls and act two is everything thereafter. And, uh, and act two um, has much more comedy towards it, but it's also a much more complex issues of fame get addressed in act two of, of, of when you look at our society today, when people go on reality TV, people will get instantaneously famous. The plan for what to do with success is oftentimes not well thought through, and Annie's plan of, for success was not that well thought through. And uh, an act two deals with a lot of, of how she was stepped from this world of uh, obscurity, but not prepared for the world of fame that she walks into, and this very vulgar world of vaudeville, where essentially going around almost as a circus performer is what she was. And in her mind, she had done this great philosophical deed but essentially the rest of society viewed this as a as stunt. And uh, and she very much had a hard time addressing that. And uh, the show very much in detail. And Michael John does a beautiful job of tackling that those issues straight on in Act 2. Since we're mentioning Michael John Lacusa and his music, um, let's delve right into that. Because obviously mm -hmm. that is going to be a major component of this piece. And, you know, typically I think most viewers, I mean, certainly I would count myself among them, find his work to be very deep and meaningful and, and quite often dark. Um, do we see elements of that in Queen of the Mist, or is it a completely yeah. different style? Uh, discuss yeah. some of the musical aspects. The director and I oftentimes, uh, we have debates on okay, where we place the show. I, I think for Michael John, it's one of his probably more accessible shows sure. uh, for, compared to others. However, it does have very deep notions of, I, I probably listened to the cast album, the off-Broadway production, um, probably uh, 10 times before I really got everything from it. It's one of those shows that it re takes repeated listening to really draw out everything that he is, he's put in it. There is the straight line story there of one goes over Niagara Falls and what happens thereafter. But there are so many subtle issues about religion, fame, the American dream, 
all these things are going through the the show. And um, the, the, the concept that he has taken, the, the musical styles are very early 20th century America. But there, so essentially you are getting bits of ragtime. You're getting bits of this all coming through different aspects of the That's show. But it, it is a, a beautiful show. And like it's very Michael John, essentially. And it is a very layered show. The, the actors uh, had uh, spent three weeks doing nothing but vocal work before they even touched the stage. There are seven actors, and uh, it's written in seven parts. So they, they all sing their own line with no one else uh, with them, and is written for very much uh, singers. So it's a, a big sing. How much involvement has uh, Mr. Lacusa had on this project, if any? Uh, yeah, uh, our director essentially uh, um, has had some degree of interaction uh, with Michael John. He uh, asking some some ideas and and pulling uh, some some notions from what he thought of the show itself, and helping our director Dom with, with some of the ways that, that he was tackling the project itself. And he's been very supportive of of the show, and I think he's very happy uh, that we have lovingly approached this show and given it the resource it requires. I think he's been, uh, some of his shows, if you don't give them the time and resource to put them together properly, um, I think a Michael John Lacusa show will fall apart. And I think some people who have done some wonderful productions of his shows and others uh, have have tackled, tried to tackle them, but have but without the resource attaching to them, I think you would lose things uh, from, from, from the original production. Sure, how long ago was his Off-Broadway? production it was, it was in 2011 so it was he wrote the show for mary testa uh who's the the, the legendary mary testa it this is, is there are moments of the show that when you're going through you can say this was could have only been done by for her knowing that she is such a big personality sure. um, and if the one benefit I, while i love the original cast album uh, her her vocal she does have Patti Lapone tendencies at, for, on her diction at some points in the cast album and uh, I'm enjoying getting to know what all the all the lyrics are our our lead actress uh, uh, Trudy Calamari she is a trained opera singer and she's on stage about um, 85 percent of the time and it's it's a huge thing uh, for her and she she knocks it out of the park every night. And while we're on the subject of the cast, uh, who else are we expecting in this uh, in this company? Could you speak more to the individual company members? Yeah, I think I mean the beautiful thing of of this show is um, I mean when we went through casting of the show is that you re- worked with people who were incredibly passionate to do a Lacusa show. So there are sometimes people um, that that it, it very much you get people who are passionate for it. And we we had numerous people who were incredibly passionate to work on this project itself, and knowing that this is. Uh, an incredibly challenging thing. Uh, so essentially, uh, we very much found people who were were incredible vocalists first, and um, uh, but uh, but as we've seen on stage, are are actually amazing actors uh, as well. And uh, surprise to my surprise, actually not bad dancers. Uh, they've uh, they uh, our our um, our director has added in any number of uh, of what I call, we call choreography that has made it throughout the show. And um, for, for, for big singers who ha- who were not cast for dancing, uh, they move quite well, but ever, all seven of them, because uh, the, the benefit of, of the, that we have in the show is that that cast of seven, other than Trudy and Will uh, Arundel, who plays her manager, uh, the other cast of five, um, they cover their line, but they play all the other characters in her life. So essentially, they end up playing numerous parts and just bang, 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 changing character on character on character, all on their vocal track, but essentially having to change characters over the course of the show. So th- for them, it's a hard show, but it's an amazing show because they are on stage, I would say probably uh, 70% of the time, just working around her and and this this huge kind of production of Annie Edson Taylor's life. Um, but all of them are beautiful uh, singers and, and great actors to work with. And, and I, I've, I've worked with, I've done numerous shows in this cast has just been a pleasure to work with. One thing that we would say with Pint of Wine that we have done, and, and I think th- this is very, when people ask what we are versus other companies and, and how we approach things are, is um, we have very much taken this as a, and uh, I, I've ta- we've taken an approach to ethical producing of, of theater. Okay. And, and, and by that I mean is, um, that that the the fringe it can be very challenging to to make things work and and uh, and I think raising funds and and making shows particularly production musicals don't happen on the fringe for a reason they're very expensive to put together and uh, and and they're difficult to fit into space 
Um, what we decided, uh, our, our approach as a company is, we do not expect people to do things for free. We don't do profit shares. We, we, we very much understand that in our production musical, you, you, you better raise funds in order to make things work. And we, we have presented this show on uh, an equity uh, fringe contract uh, on a London living wage. So, um, uh, and all of our, and, and we, sometimes people say, well, we put our cast on London living wage, but then what about your, your sound people, your lighting people, your designers? Uh, your costume people, what are they getting paid? What's your stage manager getting paid? If, if, if you don't, uh, one thing we have done is we, we embrace that every person who works on our project, we try to pay essentially, and we do pay the, the best wage we can. And we don't take advantage of people because uh, I, I, I find it sad that um, people um, will uh, will do work for exposure. And, and I think that's a, a, a dangerous slippery slope of, of what of how of what we can expect from people to do in their life essentially we, we need to value people we need to give them resources but we also need to pay people and and uh and i think that's very uh, central to to what we're doing and i think if you if you came and spoke to anyone on our production is that we've tried to one give them the resource to put on the best show possible but also make sure that that they can actually uh, uh go home and, and pay their rent which is is as important as anything else Oh, that's brilliant, and that's admirable. And at the end of the day, I suppose it's further investment into your show to make sure you get the best uh, best quality possible, isn't it? Yeah, and it it, it is that, that that you. I think when people come and see the show, I mean, the Cusa shows are challenging, and I would say that uh, there 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 is a bit of marmite to, towards some of his shows, and some people love it, and some people uh, find it slightly uh, less lovely. But I think what one 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 thing that people who have all come to see the show have appreciated that that the care and love that has gone into this full production and and trying to look after everyone working on it essentially it does come across in the final product and and um i i would hope that 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 more people can do it i know that it's it's something that that more people need to try to do but but we are doing our best to make sure that 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 we're uh, producing shows in a way that that we all can be proud of that's absolutely brilliant and uh, so now onto the more uh, an important bit of information here. Yes. Uh, where and how can folks come and see this production? Yeah, sure. So essentially, we are running uh, through the 27th. So performances are uh, Tuesday to Saturday at 7.30 p.m. at the uh, Jack Studio Theatre, which is in Broccoli, uh, which is in southeast London. And not, it takes about 30 minutes from Blackfriars on the Thames Link, so it's not that hard to get to. And uh, tickets are available on www.powtheatre.co.uk, and you can see the link to buy tickets there. What are the future plans uh, for the company? Do you have any productions in well, mind for on down the road, maybe later this year or in you know, we are We are doing a production of Mame in December, which is our... Uh, which is uh, which? My joke is I got the rights to do Mame, uh, which is being done in a, a very different way than the, the production that's going on at the Hope Mill, and uh, we, we we did not design our production to follow theirs, but uh, it'll be a very different production than theirs that will be at the Cockpit Theater in December. And uh, depending on how this production goes, we will hopefully have some news on our 2020 season very soon um, on some shows that, that I think will be consistent with uh, lots of things happening in the 2020 year uh, in world politic. Wow, that sounds great. Mr. Klein, thank you so much for being on the program, and we uh, look forward to hearing great things from the company on down the line. You have to stay in touch with us. Thank you so much for your time, sir. Thanks again to Blake Klein for being on the program. If you are listening to this episode on the day of release, you still have a few days to try and catch Queen of the Mist. As Blake mentioned, it's playing at Jack Studio Theatre at number 410 Broccoli Road in London. And it's running until the 27th, so you have a very small window to try and catch this show before it closes. To book your tickets, as mentioned, go to powtheatre.co.uk, P-O-W, and then theater with the R-E ending. And I highly recommend you go to this website. It looks fantastic. And I'm sure that there will be news to catch up on in future on all of Pine of Wine Theater's future productions. Perhaps further performances of Queen of the Mist with any luck. Thanks again for having a listen to my ramblings, friends. I appreciate it. You can follow me, as always, on Twitter at DavidHerzog06. Back to Mr. Hudson in the studio. I will see you at the theater, folks. 
Thanks, David. From one American voice to another, we're going to end this episode with another instalment of uh, Mike Shapiro's discussion on how he's getting on with his musical, The Bully Problem. Hey there, Musical Talk fans. It's Mike Shapiro. And I'm here with another installment of my writer slash producer diary, where I describe to you the process of my bringing my musical, The Bully Problem, to the Hollywood fringe this summer. The Hollywood Fringe is, of course, a relative of the Ancestral Festival in Edinburgh. It's about one-tenth the size and has much nicer weather, but lacks the cool Scottish accents. So there are pluses and minuses. Last week, I talked a bit about the process of story development, and in particular, how I took the story and iterated through several workshops and readings so that I could uh, approximate what it's like to have a performance of the show. This week, I thought I would talk a little bit more about the music side of things and maybe descend into shop talk a little bit. So generally speaking, one big decision every musical has to make when going into production is the choice as to whether to use live musicians or pre-recorded tracks for your music, which are strangely sometimes just referred to as tracks. I am generally a really big fan of having live musicians on stage for a musical, and there are a number of reasons. There's the practical side of things, in that you've got live players who can monitor the action and can adjust their playing to accommodate the change of pace or the change of dynamics, Uh, or if uh, an actor perhaps forgets a line, they can vamp a little bit and stall and, and let the actor catch up uh, or missed lyric or missed beat, they can they can adjust in real time and it provides a certain safety margin against some of the tumult and chaos that can happen in a real production. If you're using pre-recorded tracks, the cast has to essentially adhere to the recording and if they make a mistake, you're out of luck or maybe your stage manager in the booth can quickly hit pause and start but there's a, there's a kind of inflexibility there, and live musicians dodge around that and provide a, an interpretation of the music that matches the particular performance. Beyond that, though, there's, there's just this artistic element of there being a living, breathing performance. If you've got a band, you've got the, the interaction between the players. Perhaps they're, they're comping off of each other or they're just reflecting each other's energy, and it adds a kind of vitality to your music. And on top of that, there's the, I don't want to say spectacle value, but there's definitely a kind of dramatic value to having musicians visible if they're not sequestered under the stage in a pit. There's been this trend in musicals in recent years where the musicians have been on stage and kind of as fixtures or ancillary cast uh, members. I'm thinking not just of, well, I saw this phenomenon a number of times at a couple of shows in Edinburgh. And I was always impressed by the ingenuity and resourcefulness in getting musicians on stage and off stage and using very portable instruments, maybe a cajon instead of a drum set, uh, and just the, the nimble staging that allowed the musicians to be on stage and coexist in perhaps a cramped space. And this was really cool. But I've also seen this on Broadway in a couple of occasions. Uh, Waitress has the band on stage as kind of a, I guess, a restaurant band, which isn't really a thing, but we can accept that as a, as a fixture of, of the set. And even more recently, I saw the band's visit, and that had the band, the musicians and the actors who were playing musicians were kind of seamlessly blended together. So this was really cool. And, and that show in particular has a very intimate interrelationship of music and story, because it's a story about musicians. So in synopsis, There are a number of really good reasons why you should use live musicians to accompany your musical. And my show is ignoring all of them, and we are using pre-recorded tracks. Uh, The reason is, well, there are a couple. Um, Musicians are expensive, and this is not a high-budget production. Uh, Musicians take up space on stage. This is kind of the flip side of musicians being great to have on stage. They're, They're also there and you might have to dodge your choreography around them or deal with them in terms of blocking. Uh, But 
I think the real reason is we're we are a fringe production, which means we need to get our stuff on stage and off of stage in a very short period of time. I think we've got 15 minutes to basically pack up and leave afterwards, and beforehand we've got 15 minutes to get everybody set up. And if you've got a four-piece band, uh, even if the drums are already there, it's a little bit of tumult, and then you're plugging things into other things, and there's the question of the levels, are the levels the same as last time, or is your guitar player going to deafen the entire audience and blast a, a hole in the back wall like in Back to the Future? So there's there's a lot of unknowns, and although I've, I've seen fringe productions do exactly this perfectly, I didn't feel entirely courageous. So for this show, we are doing tracks, pre-recorded tracks. However, for rehearsals, we do have a music director, and uh, there are a number of reasons for this, but probably the, the reasons I described, the advantages I described to having a live band really apply here too. You've got a human being who can adjust their playing and they can prompt musicians. Uh, it's just a, a much more effective rehearsal experience with a, a pianist rather than somebody hitting play on, on the pre-recorded tracks and then trying to rewind and jump ahead and that could be a nightmare. So we do have a rehearsal pianist. To make things even more complicated, we are doing a concert presentation of three of our songs at a local showcase, uh, which is called Music Cal, Cal being short for California, and the resulting name being completely ungoogleable. Uh, and so we're doing a concert version of the songs. So there are actually three different musical arrangements. I've got to write band charts for the concert presentation, and we're doing guitar, piano, drums, and in a little twist on the old formula, bass clarinet, one of my favorite orchestral instruments instead of a bass. So that's fun, but that's a whole set of arrangements I need to do. Then I have to do the piano-only arrangements for the rehearsals, and then I'm producing the full pre-recorded tracks for the show itself. So this is quite a handful as far as music prep goes and orchestration and arrangement. Uh, luckily, I got started on this fairly early so I could dive in and just get the ball rolling. Uh, there are all these complexities, like the fact that the piano part for the rehearsal pianist is not the same thing as the piano part for the band, because the rehearsal pianist is basically being the whole band. They've got uh, bass lines and all the stuff that you'd want in a song, whereas when you put the pianist in the context of a full band, you don't want them playing everything. You want to leave room for the guitar. You want to leave room for, in my case, the bass clarinet. I generally don't advocate that one person should be writer, composer, lyricist, book writer, orchestrator, and music prep person. This is this should probably be five jobs. But uh, this being an independent production, people are going to wear multiple hats. And fortunately, I have a great team handling just about everything else. So I can focus on these myriad tasks and know that everything else is going to kind of magically take care of itself. Uh, the, the main producers are collectively an organization out here called New Musicals, Inc., which is both an educational institution as well as a budding musical theater production organization. So so it's, it's a very nice body of expertise to have in my corner. Anyway, this concludes the third uh, diary entry in this uh, self-documentary. If you'd like to learn a little bit more about the show, or a lot more about the show, then come to our website, which is thebullyproblem.com. It's just one word. There are all the links to social media. So if you're an Instagram person, you can jump to Instagram. You can find us on Facebook, et cetera, et cetera. I hope you've enjoyed this series so far, and I will see you again next time. This is Thanks Mike Shapiro to John Robbins, off. Hugh Waldridge, David Herzog, and Mike Shapiro for providing a wonderful multicolored quilt of an episode of Musical Talk. Do join us next week where we'll be talking about Only Fools and Horses, a musical I'm very, very curious to see. Thank you very much for listening, and see you then. Bye-bye. For more information about Musical Talk, please visit our website at musicaltalk.co.uk. You can email us at feedback at musicaltalk.co.uk, listen to past episodes on iTunes and YouTube, and follow our social media channels on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram.